Hair's not the right color. So I used to flirt with girls, but I'm just like a come on that you know never goes too far. Uh huh. And, you know, but like when I see them, I just take a good look at them. You know, there's like good looking girls here in Austin. Always was. I used to walk to McDonald's when I was going to work, you know, and and there was like tons of these beautiful girls, and I've never seen the same one twice. They were just like, wow. <laughs> right. Like, you know. <laughs> How are the girls in Waller, Texas? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, we, uh, in my band, the drummer is a real good looker, and uh, we, we started a new band called Danny the Nightmares, and we played it, we filmed a video in a graveyard, and the cops came because this one girl was screaming <laughs> for the video, you know? Uh -huh. And the cops came and were like, what's going on here, you know? And they, they let us off, so. Uh -huh. But we have lots of fun now. We record all kinds of rock and roll. We've been doing a lot of shows. And, uh, you know, and, and the big thing though now is that Rejected Unknown is out, uh, produced by Brian Beatty. Rejected Unknown, right there. Yeah. <laughs> Some of your great artwork, of yeah. course, adorning the cover. And uh, this is real nice artwork. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's like it's different artwork than the original release. Uh huh. And it was uh, picked up by Witch Records, so That's hot. so we're pleased with that. It got all the spellings right and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're pleased to have you here, Daniel. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. You know, yeah, I, you know, I love show business. I just feel, you know, like a star. And when I when I don't feel like I'm a star, I'm just like you know sleepy maybe or something <laughs> just writing songs all day and I'm, like, I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it show business day you're gonna make it Joe Coyne you're gonna make it you know it so right. I go out there every day bang on that piano and I'm going for it yeah well the new album sounds great you know it sounds like uh, you know from the you know the new book you got out and uh, you got yeah. a band and things, I'm things seem to be that book together. So they put a lot of work into it it's pretty cool huh? yeah and uh, yeah. it you know things seem to be heading your way in 2000 you know mm -hmm. and I know uh, well, you know, w what sort of changes uh, have have occurred uh, since you first started recording back in like 1981? Well, this last year, 1999, uh, for the first time, I went on tour with a group called Brown Hornet, sort of a jazz rock band, jazz fusion rock band, and we played shit. We went to California, we went to New York, you know, and I went to New York about four times on my own. My dad went with me. We played in Berlin, and Switzerland, and. Um, so it's like I'd never toured before. I hadn't played for a number of years, and then just finally had the opportunity and went for it. So right. it's been a lot of fun. So I've really been, you know, played out more than ever before, and and I get enough money to buy all the comic books I want. So it keeps me happy, you know. Yeah. What, and I'm trying your, to save up some money too, you know. What's your favorite comic book these days? Oh, it's always been Captain America. You know, Jack Kirby. It's the greatest. You know, <laughs> that's how I feel about it. You know, uh -huh. I draw Captain Americas all the time. I trade them at the comic book store for uh, comic books. I bring my drawings in, you know. Okay. They, so it's cool. <laughs> here, here in Austin, you trade them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I do that at the record store too. Okay. So you know, I'll get a bunch of records at discount. I get the 99 cent records. You never know. I found Rubber Soul, Revolver, all kinds of Beatle albums, some Beatle solo albums for like 99 cents. And then I get the 50 cent discount, and it's like 50 cents, you know. And I'm going, this is so cool. I got this record. It's a great record, man. Right. And there they are, right there, for 50 cents. Do you yeah. remember the first time you heard the Beatles? Yeah, I, would have, I, was, I was talking about it earlier. I, I bought a, got a bunch of singles when I was a kid in, um, at a rum sale my mother was working at. And I played them all, and I ch picked out the ones I liked best, and I looked, and they were both Paul McCartney. And one was High, High, High and Sea Moon which is kind of where to get a hold of. And, uh, and then I remember, uh, then I, I, I was at a record store and I saw the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper, you know, and I, and I thought to myself, well, this is Paul's old band. I wonder if they were any good. <laughs> and I said, pretty humorous. But after the Beatles hit me, I was gone. I never came back. Uh, Believe me, it was too far gone, you know. Okay. And, and uh, <laughs> do, do you think there's a big Beatles influence in your music? Oh, no, definitely. Definitely, definitely a Beatles influence in my music for sure. You know, because uh, I had a uh, Beatles songbook called The Complete Beatles, and I was playing my favorite tunes and stuff. And then I heard Ringo say in an interview, he said that uh, the Beatles would often take chords from other people and rearrange them and make their own songs, sort of something to start with, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, when I heard that, I started doing that all the time with the Beatles songbook, you know. Okay. And then I had the Bob Dylan songbook and all these different than fake books, whatever I could to get formulas for songs. I was like writing all the time. and But this year, 
I was criticized for using songbooks uh, arrangements, and so I tried to just sound it out for a year, mostly CFG. This year is 2000, you know, uh -huh. and so it's, it's a struggle to get a tune out of it. But I love the Beach Boys. They they said they did a lot, like heroes and the villains. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> right. Well, I've you know, seen you before some plays, right? Yeah, I met you last year at the yeah. uh, after your electric lounge gig. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I remember asking you what, what was the best part of being up on stage and. You know, you kind of had a funny answer for me. So, what what is the best part of being out on stage? Well, the girls. You know, I mean, I was at a uh, Flock of Seagulls concert once in Astroworld, when I was working at Astroworld during the recording of Yip Jump Music, and they were like throwing bras up on stage, and the guy was going, hey, 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 and I was saying, hey, that's that's rock and roll, man. Okay. All right. Okay. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> sounds pretty good. Yeah. So, so, so rock and roll is is your oh, life. We love rock, rock and, ro and roll. You know, imagine a world without rock and roll. There'd be no heart. There'd be no soul. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, me and a friend wrote that. It's one of our songs for Danny and the Nightmares. I was playing with that uh, Jad Fair and, and I and another kid from uh, Austin recorded an album together at my house, and they stayed over for a couple of weeks. And uh, we, we, we did a show, and after the show, this guy came up and he said, uh, Hey, you're from Waller. I'm from Waller, too. I said, You play guitar? I goes, Yeah. I go, All right. Yeah. And after that, after the, the whole thing was over, I was playing out with Jad Fair. We just started recording all the time and, you know, had a lot of fun. And, you know, and um, we just had a really good time. And his wife plays drums and he plays guitar. And we got another guitar player and a bass player also. We've done a number wow, of shows. Yeah. It's the best music that I've been involved with that I could like really cultivate more because we've had more rehearsals than anything right. I've ever re rehearsed with. Like when we did a continued story in Texas Texas Instruments, I did a show with them one night and I was allotted the uh, studio time, you know. Right. I said, hey, would you guys like to record with me tomorrow? I'm working on it. I said, sure. We get in, we just like improvised everything. It was a lot of fun, like Dead Dog and the Laughing in the Cloud, you know, and the Herb Blues, just like one take, you know. And uh, then we, we got Bill Anderson in for... Uh, to record uh, girls with us with the Texas Instruments. I remember that he was playing with Poison 13 at the time, and I was like, Poison 13 was my favorite group, you know. Right. And now Bill Anderson is playing with me in a group I call I with Brian Beatty and Dave Cameron and Craig Ross. You made her, of course. Right. Her. And it's and we're playing tonight at the Texas Union Ballroom at 12 o'clock. Okay. At night. So. And. Uh, what, what, what do you think the difference is? Why, why has the last year been so productive for you? Well, it's like, uh, uh, it's just that uh, I've just had uh, more opportunity and, uh, and uh, because, uh, because it's just, I, I, I don't know, I think it's my dad, since my dad took over as manager, he lets me know what's going on. Because I had one manager a long time ago, I guess it was Jeff Tartikoff. I still, I still like Jeff Tartikoff, he's a good friend of mine. But he got was told that Tiny Tim wanted to record with me, and I would have loved that. Cause I love Tiny Tim's chord progressions; they're right. so great. I used to do a erotic uh, version of Tiptoe for the Tulips, and uh, he, he didn't tell me, right? So, like Tiny Tim died a few years later. Right. And by the time I found out, this guy says, "Yeah, Tiny wanted to record with you," and I go, "Oh, well, wow. I don't know what to do." They didn't tell me, but my dad lets me know everything about it, and and he told me about you know all this and 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 spend you spend an interview and now it's MTV and tomorrow I'm probably back in the scrap heap with all the other dead rock and rollers I don't know but, <laughs> you know I have a song about born to rock it was like you find yourself on the back on the cover of a magazine you say it is what it is and should you refuse to play they say you were born to rock <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so, and uh, what, what do you think the biggest difference at uh, South by Southwest is? I mean, you were yeah. you, you were here in the beginning, and now yeah, it's it's, it's really great. It's, it's a lot bigger now, and there's so many bands you couldn't possibly see them all. But it's like uh, we're doing a show with John Cale tonight, and uh, it's just there's more now than it's ever been. It's never been as big as this, and you know, it's interesting because there's so many interesting stuff, and and uh, so and my, the new album is on Witch Records. And uh, with the new artwork, and uh, then I also have uh, Danny the Nightmares 
the CD that I printed up myself. Right, yeah. Before the contract, I got away with it to put it out because it was before the contract with which was signed. Okay. So it's pretty much a bootleg though because it only made 500 copies. And we've been selling pretty well. We sold like 30 at a show, which, you know, you know but uh, we, we, we're trying to uh, get some gigs and we, we love playing out. So okay. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay. And uh, when uh, when you come to New York, I know last time you were in New York, you played and your your pockets were overflowing with money or in a, in a bodega after the show. Do you remember that? I don't. I okay. don't remember at all. Okay. <laughs> after like a, a hootenanny at the lock, with lock, like on a Monday night. Uh, I, call. I really don't yeah. know anything okay. about it. Right. I went to this. Oh, I know what you're talking about. They had me play at this really weird bar. It was like down in the basement someplace. And all these people were like real freaks. They were so arty and stylistic. Uh, stylistic. I thought it was great. You know, they, they looked like they were all in the opium or something. I played a few songs and like they got into it. And then I sat down and they, they one, I got all kinds of money. That's it. What you're right. About, right? They kept handing me money and they gave me a hundred dollar bill. And there was a girl there, like and she, like she's like cutting up next to me and she starts kissing me and stuff. I'm going, yeah, you know. And I gave her a hundred dollar bill. And like you know, and then I walked upstairs, and I had lots of money. They must have been rich people to give me. And she goes, "Can I have another 20? I go, "Sure." You know, you know what the heck? You know, it was hilarious. And then one time when I was playing at the knitting factory, after I did the show, I I walked up backwards. I was standing there talking, so I was looking around or something, and I heard a noise behind me, and this guy bumped into me and fell flat on his face. And I looked at him, and he said, "I couldn't believe it was you." He like phased out, you know. They had to call the ambulance. <laughs> in that area. Wow! wow. You know, it's not exactly Beatlemania, but you right. know, like it's more or less a round of applause, maybe for a song. Right. So I get by, right? Well, when you were when you you know were on the uh, traveling carnival, uh, could mm -hmm. you did you ever imagine yourself being on stage, or was that yeah, like a dream at that time? Yeah, with determination. When I knew that the last stop of the carnival would be Austin, that I did, you know I originally was uh, thinking that I could make it as a comic book and comic book artists in Austin, you know, because of like Gilbert Shotton and the Freak Brothers and stuff like that. I thought that it was still going on and I could try to get, I never thought at that point that I could make it with my music. I was thinking it would be my cartoon. Okay. But I was really surprised when uh, I saw a Glass Eye uh, article in the garbage and I read it and I thought that's pretty cool. And then I sat down, turned on the radio and the guy goes, and now Glass Eye. And they played Marlowe, the nice. first album. I go, that is so great. And then I saw a poster they were playing out. I went to their show, and I took Kathy, the lead singer, uh, one of my tapes. And then the next time they had a show, I went again and gave her another tape, Hi, How Are You? And uh, the time after that, she said, uh, you can play, but you need to get a band or something. You could open up for it. So I started opening up for her just by playing by myself. Okay. And uh, that was how I started out in Austin. Okay. In a roundabout way, whatever. You, I lost track. You know? No, that's all right. Um, We'll just end it up here. Could you just, uh, okay. can you, you just say hi to like spin.com and okay, happy? Okay, hi spin.com. The world is always there. That's a good slogan. Everybody's saying it, you know. Okay, and <laughs> okay, uh, I try my best. That's I, our, I mean, and it's our, it's our 15th anniversary of the oh, magazine. Really? If okay, you could just say hi, 15th anniversary. I remember, yeah, happy Christmas, every spin editor. I love all those fantastic articles. I believe in rock and roll. I believe in art. I believe in the music, and uh, I believe in Spin Magazine. So, happy Spin Magazine. All right, Brock. All right. <laughs>